So, I mean, we've talked before, and again, I'm talking to my friend, journalist David Dayan. You can find his work at davedayan.com. And we've talked many times about how, and even you said at the beginning that Dodd-Frank, you know, obviously didn't go far enough. It, It was clearly, you know, just a, you know, piecemeal type of solution here. But like, what percentage of Dodd Frank is actually in effect now? Like, uh, out of all the weird res, what what do we actually know? Like, is it like twenty five percent, fifty percent? So, wh- where actually are we of uh, of all the regulations that were in Dodd Frank of actually being in the, these regular committees, actually being in place and being enforced right now? Right. The last I heard was uh, a little over a third. It's probably more like forty percent now. But think wow. about it. We're four years out from when Dodd-Frank was passed. It was passed in July of 2010. It is now April of 2014, and we're talking at best that 40% of it is operative. Um, (laughs) So that's a real problem for the regulatory community. Of course, Dodd-Frank almost wasn't a law, but it was a promise to write a law later. (laughs) And and this promise has, has, has been sort of extinguished in some sense. Uh, because the regulators just have endless delays, and, and some of the delays are created by banks who continue to lobby them for continued delays and changes to the rules and things of that nature. So uh, it, it's, it's, it's kind of a, 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 an accumulation of a number of different things why these, these deadlines are slipping. Uh, but it, that is the way that this operates. That uh, you know, a lot of us, uh, I, I think, a lot of Democrats saw the passage of Dodd Frank as an ending. Uh, when to the financial industry, it was a beginning. It was it was the next phase of lobbying started at that moment, uh, and uh, basically the, the the reform community was just outgunned uh, in that process. And uh, when the rule writing went, sort of went into place. Again, I'm talking to my friend, journalist David Dayan. You can find his work at davedayan.com. Let's move on to another article. I mean, it's connected to especially the first story that we were talking about, and actually, you know, also uh, to the second as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, you actually wrote recently for The American Prospect on how, I mean, you know, you, you've been, you know, uh, ringing the warning bell on this for a long time, and we have other people who have as well, but you actually wrote at the American Prospect on how uh, now actually not only, like, lefty uh, economists and, and writers, but also we actually have reports recently by the Federal Reserve and the IMF actually saying that the system is rigged. And it, 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 so it's really actually kind of interesting that at least the, the bigger guns are actually kind of coming into this. So tell us about that. Yeah, it's not just interesting, it's, it's very important. Um, yeah. Basically what we're talking about is the subsidy that big banks get over their competitors. And the reason for this subsidy is that uh, there's a perception with, among the marketplace. Every bank borrows money, right? But there's a perception that the bigger banks are, as we like to put it, too big to fail. And because they're too big to fail, investors know that if they invest in a large bank, if they, they lend money to a large bank, that they're, whether they do good or bad, they're going to be bailed out if they get into trouble, and they'll return their investment. Uh, so so they, they almost can't lose when they, they lend money to a big bank. And that manifests itself in that uh, because they, they have higher risk and could lose the investors, uh, with a smaller bank, they lend money at cheaper rates to the big bank, uh, where it's almost an ironclad guarantee because of the too big to fail, uh, than to a smaller bank where there is some risk of actually losing the money. So a number of play, uh, uh, economists and, and organizations have tried to quantify that, that subsidy. How much money do big banks save over their smaller counterparts and lower borrowing costs because of their perception that they'll get a government bailout if they get into trouble. And the Federal Reserve took a look at this, and the the International Monetary Fund took a look at this over the last few weeks. The Fed only looked at numbers up to 2009, so it didn't incorporate Dodd-Frank, and they did see a subsidy, and it was something on the order of uh, $50 billion a year, uh, that goes to the big banks because of a government promise. So that's wow. you know 
five or six hundred billion dollars over a ten year window, which is the way we like to talk about things in budget terms. Uh, the IMF looked at more recent data. They incorporated post Dodd Frank data into their data set. And they had a wide variety of, of, it depends on how you measure this or a number of ways to actually measure this. Uh, and they, the IMF found an annual subsidy to the big banks of anywhere between 15 and $70 billion a year. So it's either a little bit smaller than what the Federal Reserve found or even larger than what the Federal Reserve found. And it, to me, this kind of ends the debate. You know, there was a debate over whether this subsidy still existed in the wake of Dodd-Frank or, or whether investors lost the perception that banks were too big to fail because of Dodd-Frank's, uh, you know, supposed elimination of bailouts and things of that nature. Uh, the IMF is not a lefty organization, as you say. <laughs> the, the Fed is not a lefty organization. And if they believe, if they agree that this this bailout subsidy, this too-big-to-fail subsidy still exists, then really the only people on the other side are the big banks themselves. The only reports that are coming out that say, oh, no, Dodd-Frank ended too-big-to-fail are ones that are funded by big banks. So uh, it, it, it kind of ends the debate in my mind. And, and you know, that's important because uh, there is sort of a bipartisan coalition around, you know, looking at and attacking this subsidy and ending it, uh, whether it's through higher capital requirements, which is something we talked about, or actually size caps on the biggest uh, financial institutions and cutting them down to size. So this only gives ammunition to that bipartisan coalition if they can say even the IMF believes or even the Federal Reserve believes that there is a continued subsidy that government is handing over to banks and it's a very large subsidy. Uh, then they can you know, make a lot of headway in this debate. Uh, and and the, maybe, maybe this doesn't happen in the next year, but it, if there is another financial crisis, there's a lot of ability to have a real reform solution uh, with, with ideas that are off the shelf and, and have been studied uh, rather than the sort of ad hoc process we went through in the wake of Dodd-Frank or the wake of financial crisis. 